for us as we go. Right, the recording should be running. Let's start the presentation. Okay, here we go. Um, so um, I've got two computers here as well, which just makes life a little more interesting. Right, okay, can I just say that this presentation this evening is primarily for use of the parents and students of Maiden Early School. Um, it will be put onto the website eventually, probably by, where are we now? Probably by the beginning of next week. Um, so, and also the PowerPoint will be available um, on the website as well. So you do not have to worry about um, scribbling any notes. Uh, the one thing is, is Miss Cheshire is going to be looking at answering the questions. So if you've got any questions, please post them in the chat box um, as we go through. So hopefully this will now move on. Go Right, okay. Um, UCAS applying for university entry in 2023. Can I just say that where we have slides that have a little, my, my little pupil there, that means I've actually shared that slide with the students. Some are obviously unique to you and others are for use with, um, the students. So here we go. This is my particular mantra, which I use quite a lot with the uh, students. In other words, preparation is everything. Uh, they've had this on a number of occasions where we've said uh, failing to prepare is preparing to fail, be that for university, apprenticeship or work. And as Miss Cheshire said, we, we, we cover all of those aspects for the students over the next um, period of time. But primarily at the moment, we're talking about UCAS this evening. One of the key things for the students is the UCAS website. Um, and you as parents can also look at the UCAS website, do all sorts of searches and various areas. And if you were to scroll well, fairly well down on the website, you can actually register for updates from UCAS should you wish to have them as parent updates, which will tell you all sorts of very useful um, pieces of information. So the UCAS website, UCAS.com, is where we go for absolutely everything. Right, these are one or two things I want to cover. I'm going to mention Google Classroom. We're going to talk about predicted grades. I'm going to talk open days, and I'm going to talk about the roadmap through the UCAS process. So first of all, we have, do have a Google Classroom dedicated um, to the UCAS process. The students should know about that. And in all the information which I get, I post there. Typically on Tuesday of this week, I posted about 15 new bits of information from various universities about uh, open days, et cetera, et cetera. So the students are aware of that. Um, you know, if you wish to actually ask them about more information, that's great. And that's where I tend to post it, the dedicated classroom. Okay, let's just deal with the elephant in the room, if you like. It's the one thing called predicted grades. Um, predicted grades for the students are based on their prelims, which they have just taken, and prior performance during the year up to the point at which the predicted grades happen. So in other words, the predicted grades are set in, some, in about mid-September. So the students have got quite a lot of time to actually do that um, and come up with. And I can assure you, we have been doing this process for a long time. And in fact, in my case, 29 years. So um, I know I think there are some parents last year who I actually taught while I was at Maiden Only School. So, you know, I have we do have a good basis on what we do with that. There's a lot of experience. The staff know what they're looking at and what to look for. Um, and I obviously look at the predicted grades as well, uh, looking at GCSE, um, flight pass, all of those bits and pieces. And we are pretty accurate on our predicted grades. Can I just say that there is no negotiation on predicted grades? We say this to the students, and we say this. I've had emails in the past from parents who are saying, you know, a predicted grade is a C. My son or daughter needs an A to go for that particular course. Well, number one, a son or daughter should have had a chat with me. And secondly, you know, the, the, the predicted grade is based on our professional experience. And we don't want to set up students to fail because obviously if we predict a student for an A for, and they went for a course and then don't actually achieve that A, then obviously they're not gonna get on the course and then it becomes quite an interesting process in the summer of 2023. So can I just put that one there and say, you know, we make a professional judgment and the predicted grades we work with. Also, um, there is a subject reference which is written by the subject staff. It's normally written in a number of cases before the summer holidays and finished off after the summer holidays. 
and it's based on the students' performance this year and the staff's knowledge of the students. By this sort of time, you know, staff have a good knowledge of the students. You may say, well, what happens? We always have staff who move on. Well, the staff who are moving on, um, maybe going on to other jobs, etc., they will have completed their subject references before the summer holidays so that we actually have a good record of what the students are like and what the staff and how the staff think they will be performing when they apply to university. So then we have the next one, and that is um, GCSE grades are something that universities do look at. I encourage the students to have a look at a course they want to go at. Some of them actually ask for particular, you know, particular grades. I cite the example of my, my own son, currently a doctor, when he was looking to apply to go and study medicine. He wanted to apply to Birmingham University to do surgery, and they wanted an A star in English language. Unfortunately, he only had an A. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that, you know, students, we do encourage the students to have a look because there's no good applying to a course and finding that actually they wanted a particular G GCSE grade. Okay, we encourage the students to use various search tools, the search.ucos.com, they can search by subject, they can search by uh, course, and also they can search by just literally googling the university. Um, we encourage the students to do plenty of research and by using the UCAS website, there's something called the UCAS Hub, which allows them to save their searches in preparation for their application. Um, there is something called the UCAS Tariff Table. If you type into Google UCAS Tariff Table, it will tell you various bits and pieces. But what it does actually say, and it's the third bullet point, is some other things that the students may have done actually count for points towards their university application. So for example, if they've done the D of E bronze to gold, that goes towards points. And somebody said to me this week, well, does bronze and silver count? Well, it doesn't get you any points, but the fact that you've put that sort of maybe two years worth of effort into a two years of Duke of Edinburgh, that counts. Any music awards, sport, regular babysitting, done a job for a few years, that is something that you know counts for everybody. And the important point is that we say to the students, everyone's been affected by COVID, so there's no point in writing a great long essay about how they were affected by COVID when they do their personal statement. But the top two points is what grades do they need to get at A level to do a particular course? Not all courses are the same. Not all courses require the same A level grades. So we norm I normally say to the students, you know, look at a couple of courses that are aspirational. One which really sort of hits their predicted grades maybe, and maybe a couple of uh, courses at universities that require maybe slightly lower grades. And also just making sure that they've got the right subjects, um, because some universities will not allow them to study unless they've done uh, a particular A level for us as we go. Right, the recording should be running. Let's start the presentation. OK, here we go. Um, so, um, I've got two computers here as well, which just makes life a little more interesting. Right. OK, can I just say that this presentation this evening is primarily for use of the parents and students of Maidenhead School. Um, it will be put onto the website eventually, probably by where are we now? Probably by the beginning of next week. Um, so and also the PowerPoint will be available um, on the website as well. So you do not have to worry about um, scribbling any notes. Uh, the one thing is, is Miss Cheshire is going to be looking at answering the questions. So if you've got any questions, please post them in the chat box um, as we go through. So hopefully this will now move on. Go Right, okay. Um, UCAS applying for university entry in 2023. Can I just say that where we have slides that have a little, my, my little pupil there, that means I've actually shared that slide with the students. Some are obviously unique to you and others are for use with um, the students. So here we go. This is my particular mantra, which I use quite a lot with the uh, students. In other words, preparation is everything. Uh, they've had this on a number of occasions where we've said uh, failing to prepare is preparing to fail be that for university apprenticeship or work and as Miss Cheshire said we, we we cover all of those aspects for the students over the next um, period of time but primarily at the moment we're talking about UCAS this evening. One of the key things for the students is the UCAS website um, and you as parents can also look at the UCAS website do all sorts of searches 
and various areas. And if you were to scroll well, fairly well down on the website, you can actually register for updates from UCAS should you wish to have them as parent updates, which will tell you all sorts of very useful um, pieces of information. So the UCAS website, UCAS.com, is where we go for absolutely everything. Right, these are one or two things I want to cover. I'm going to mention Google Classroom. We're going to talk about predicted grades. I'm going to talk open days, and I'm going to talk about the roadmap through the UCAS process. So first of all, we have do have a Google Classroom dedicated um, to the UCAS process. The students should know about that. And then all the information which I get, I post there. Typically on Tuesday of this week, I posted about 15 new bits of information from various universities about uh, open days, et cetera, et cetera. So the students are aware of that. Um, you know, if you wish to actually ask them about more information, that's great. And that's where I tend to post it, the dedicated classroom. Okay, let's just deal with the elephant in the room, if you like. It's the one thing called predicted grades. Um, predicted grades for the students are based on their prelims, which they have just taken, and prior performance during the year up to the point at which the predicted grades happen. So in other words, the predicted grades are set in, some, in about mid-September. So the students have got quite a lot of time to actually do that um, and come up with. And I can assure you, we have been doing this process for a long time. And in fact, in my case, 29 years. So um, I know I think there are some parents last year who I actually taught while I was at Maiden Only School. So, you know, I have we do have a good basis on what we do with that. There's a lot of experience. The staff know what they're looking at and what to look for. Um, and I obviously look at the predicted grades as well, uh, looking at GCSE, um, flight pass, all of those bits and pieces. And we are pretty accurate on our predicted grades. Can I just say that there is no negotiation on predicted grades? We say this to the students, and we say this. I've had emails in the past from parents who are saying, you know, a predicted grade is a C. My son or daughter needs an A to go for that particular course. Well, number one, a son or daughter should have had a chat with me. And secondly, you know, the, the, the predicted grade is based on our professional experience. And we don't want to set up students to fail because obviously if we predict a student for an A for, and they went for a course and then don't actually achieve that A, then obviously they're not gonna get on the course and then it becomes quite an interesting process in the summer of 2023. So can I just put that one there and say, you know, we make a professional judgment and the predicted grades we work with. Also, um, there is a subject reference which is written by the subject staff. It's normally written in a number of cases before the summer holidays and finished off after the summer holidays. And it's based on the student's performance this year and the staff's knowledge of the students. By this sort of time, you know, staff have a good knowledge of the students. You may say, well, what happens? We always have staff who move on. Well, the staff who are moving on, um, maybe going on to other jobs, etc., they will have completed their subject references before the summer holidays so that we actually have a good record of what the students are like and what the staff and how the staff think they will be performing when they apply to university. So then we have the next one, and that is um, GCSE grades are something that the universities do look at. I encourage the students to have a look at a course they want to go at. Some of them actually ask for particular, you know, particular grades. I cite the example of my, my own son, currently a doctor, when he was looking to apply to go and study medicine. He wanted to apply to Birmingham University to do surgery, and they wanted an A star in English language. Unfortunately, he only had an A. Uh, so that's the sort of thing that, you know, students, we do encourage the students to have a look because there's no good applying to a course and finding that actually they wanted a particular G GCSE grade. Okay, we encourage the students to use various search tools, the search.ucos.com, they can search by subject, they can search by uh, course, and also they can search by just literally Googling the university. Um, we encourage the students to do plenty of research and by using the UCAS website, there's something called the UCAS hub, which allows them to save their searches in preparation for their application. Um, there is something called the UCAS tariff table. If you type into Google UCAS tariff table, it will tell you various bits and pieces. But what it does actually say, and it's the third bullet point, is some other things that the students may have done actually count for points towards their university application. 
So for example, if they've done the D of E bronze to gold, that goes towards points. And somebody said to me this week, well, does bronze and silver count? Well, it doesn't get you any points, but the fact that you've put that sort of maybe two years worth of effort into a two years of Duke of Edinburgh, that counts. Any music awards, sport, regular babysitting, done a job for a few years, that is something that, you know, counts for everybody. And the important point is that we say to the students, everyone's been affected by COVID, so there's no point in writing a great long essay about how they were affected by COVID when they do their personal statement. But the top two points is what grades do they need to get at A level to do a particular course? Not all courses are the same. Not all courses require the same A level grades. So we norm I normally say to the students, you know, look at a couple of courses that are aspirational. One which really sort of hits their predicted grades maybe, and maybe a couple of uh, courses at universities that require maybe slightly lower grades. And also just making sure that they've got the right subjects. Um, because some universities will not allow them to study unless they've done uh, a particular A level. OK, tests. Increasingly, um, there are additional tests which universities, particularly the Russell Group universities, are now asking the students to take. Um, this was the particular group. I've missed one off, which was the science test. But these are obviously for the medics people, there's the BMAT and the UK CAT, that's also needed by most of the veterinary schools. There's now the LNATs, the MNATs, the, the TSA, LNAT, HAT, you know, and I think, I think there's a science one as well. Um, and there may be a couple of others and some universities want particular tests. It's up to the students to make sure they know what the tests are that are required. Um, most of those are available to, we, we actually are a centre for those, UCAT has to be taken at one of the Pearson centres. Uh, the modern languages admission test involves, uh, last year involved an online piece and a written piece. Um, so there's all of those sorts of bits and pieces students need to be aware of that when they do it. About work experience, all students should have done work experience, but what's important is that they keep a record of the contact of the people who they did their work experience with. Um, some universities are now asking for what's called a, a records and assessments sheet, which they get after they have put in an application, for which they ask them about their work experience and ask them who they've done it with, because believe it or not, some students actually don't exactly tell the truth about their work experience. And some universities now like a follow up and will randomly um, get hold of various contacts. So just be aware of that for that one. OK, for those of you who don't know, this is a list of the 21 universities part of the Russell Group. That is the top 21 universities in the country. Um, generally, their admission grades tend to be slightly higher. Um, and but we encourage our students, particularly the higher achieving students, to at least put a couple of the Russell Group universities in their applications, although only if they offer the courses that are required. Open days. Well, we now open days are now happening. Um, the one comment I would make is that we've encouraged all of the students to contact me about when they're going on open days. And I've been clearing quite a few with it with attendance. I think basically at this particular point in time, I think we could put on our own train through through Reading down to Bath. And I think it's Bristol on Friday because there are quite a lot of students going that way and quite a lot going up to London on Friday as well. But we encourage the students, and one of the key things for them to do is actually to book their place, book the, the talks, because if they don't, they can uh, find that, you know, they end up in a queue and it's a waste of time spending an hour to go and listen to uh, a particular talk when they could actually be viewing the um, university itself. So we always say book your place, get on a train and go. After all, that is how they're going to be traveling to and from university, probably. Uh, go with a friend. As I said, it looks like there are a lot of friends going to be on the train from, from Reading on Friday. Um, but you can put down up to five choices. But obviously, the students may wish to visit more than five universities. Our general guidance is that they can have two days out of school this term and two days out of school next term. Um, although I think we've been a little bit flexible on that one. And, you know, they can, providing they're not doing too many, because obviously it's critical to make the correct choices. And I have given them a brief as to what they need to look at when they go. Okay, so here we go for the roadmap. Uh, these are all the critical dates 
for the students when it comes to their university application. So the yellow one is where we're at today. So just to give you a bit of background, on the 20th of May, I talked about the UCAS process to the students. Uh, last Friday, we had our UCAS application launch assembly when I explained exactly how they've needed to fill in various bits and pieces on the UCAS application. I managed to get through that in 32 minutes this year, which was quite good going. Um, then tomorrow, they've actually got an assembly on personal statements. And then on 24th of June is the Future Pathways Day, when they're going to get an hour to look at personal statements and put, start to gather some of that information together for their personal statements. Then we come into the, the key sort of dates, and that is for those students who are um, making an early entry to, Ox to the universities, that's Oxford, Ca um, Cambridge, medics, vets, dentists, one or two other medical courses, they have to have their application completed and submitted to us by the 30th of September uh, so that it can actually hit the early entry deadline made by UCAS, which is a Saturday this year, the 15th of October at six o'clock in the evening. Um, we hope to have all of our early entries processed long before then, but that is a particular deadline. For the rest of the students, we insist that their application is uh, completed by the 3rd of January. That is their, um, that's the first day of the spring term. Uh, that doesn't mean to say they can't submit them earlier. We would hope that by the time we get to sort of Christmas, the majority of the university applications are in. Just to explain, I do read every single application. This year we put in 204. So I have done a lot of application reading and sending back and therefore, we, we allow that little bit of extra time. So if there are errors on the UCAS form, we've got what we call bounce back time. And then on January the 25th at again 6 p.m. is what we call the UCAS deadline. What that actually means is that if a student wishes to definitely have their application looked at, they need to have it in by that particular date. That doesn't mean to say students can't apply after that date, but after that particular date, the um, universities do not necessarily have to consider the application, for example, if a course has already got its number of offers. Um, going through the other dates, um, I'll just give you this one. Uh, on the 25th of February, something called UCAS Extra Opens, that is for students who have had a complete set of um, no offers, they can start doing some additional bits and pieces. There are various offer dates, decision dates, um, and when they have to make a decision by the time they've had all their offers right the way through to May. And then any applications made after the 30th of June goes into clearing. Some of you remember clearing used to be that thing that happened on results day. It doesn't happen any, that late anymore. Um, if students don't have a, any offers, they can actually go into start looking around clearing on the 5th of July. Um, 2023, I've put to be confirmed. I don't know what results day A level results will be in the summer of 2023. It's likely to be, it'll be mid August, but that will obviously come further later on. And actually, students can still apply to go to university right the way up to the 22nd of September 2023. Uh, we trust that nobody will be doing that. But obviously, students may think they want to do a particular, maybe want to go off and do a work and suddenly have a change of heart, and we can actually process that. We do say to students that who don't um, complete an application um, by 2023, we will support them for up to three years after they have left school because we keep all of that information about their application. Okay, so let's quickly run through the process. Um, so, Basically, the student completes the application online. Some of you may remember the days of paper forms or half paper, half online. They have to complete the following sections, their personal details, finance, backgrounds, education and work, their course selection, personal statement, and then they pay for the application and send it to the school. What then happens is we check the application, make sure the exam results they put in are correct. As I said, application bounce back if necessary they resubmit it, you don't, they don't have to pay again. And while that's going on, the subject teachers have written the references, uh, the school adds a reference with the tutor information, and then I do a final check and it's all sent to UCAS by myself. So that is a brief outline of the process. What UCAS then do is that they will check the application and personal statement. 
sends the application to the universities. Can I just say something there? In the, in the olden days, you had to, one, you had a paper form, you had to put the universities in the right order. And if you didn't put, for example, Imperial in London above Queen Mary College, Imperial wouldn't look at you. Can I just say these days, the universities do not know which university the student, other universities the students have applied to. As soon as their application has gone and been received, sometimes within about 20 minutes, they get an email to say, thank you very much. You can now what's called UCAS track. That's a different area of the website and offers get fed back to the students. That's how they communicate with the universities. The results are then on results day sent to the universities and we go through something called confirmation and clearing. Something the students will be given plenty of information about when we get into year 13. One of the things you need to be aware of is that admissions tutors consider the predicted grades fairly quickly normally. GCSE grades, the school reference, and then the personal statement, and possibly any external or internal tests. What the students are told to do is to check the order in which that application process happens. For example, I know that if you're applying to do medicine at Southampton, they look at the UCAT and that's all they look at. Whereas Bristol, look at the GCSEs to decide who they're going to interview. So the students can access that information and if they're unsure, they can come and see me. One or two bits and pieces I just want to clarify with the parents and that is with you. And that is we've had a, one of the options is for their finances. And some parents have said, oh, but we're not gonna take out a loan. Um, and so the students select this option here and um, they, they select private finance. If that's put down as private finance, the students are eligible for the full 36,500 pounds for the fees. What happens is if they put down number two, which is UK and student finance service, they don't actually have to take out a student loan. But what it does mean is that Wokingham or Reading or West Berkshire or Oxfordshire make up the rest and the, and the students are only liable for the £9,250. So it's important that actually that one, that particular box is put correctly by the students. Um, and so, but they don't have to take out a student loan if that's the way it needs to be. The other thing that's important is they make sure they get the dates right. Um, I already had one student who's virtually got their application almost completed, but hadn't put down their A-level results, A-levels they were taking. So that's a common one and they get the dates wrong. I have had students who've put 1916 as to when they started at Maiden Early School. Um, it will actually allow them to put any date they like, but um, so it's important that they get those right. Um, and when they are particularly sitting particular qualifications. And obviously um, for students who did not originate from Maiden Early School, they need to put down which school they were at from those particular dates. I've just used MER as the example. One of the things that the students do need to be aware of, and I have been through this, is this thing about disability. Um, a lot of students in the past have said, oh, I don't want to put anything down, but can I say it's, Nothing that they put there will affect their application. This is a slide taken straight from my presentation. Um, the universities do not see it immediately when the students apply, but once they have got, once offers have been made, then it becomes available to the university so they can help the students to do various bits and pieces. When I was a tutor about, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, I had a student who put down that actually they had got um, cystic fibrosis. And that was the first time the school knew that this particular student had CF. They'd managed it all the way through their school career without anybody knowing so far. But as soon as the university found out, they offered them special hall of consideration, all sorts of other bits and pieces. So it's important that if there is an issue that um, the students put that in there. Um, can I say also, there's a one in there about parental education. And there's also a thing about um, what, per, what the pair, what you as parents do. Can I say this may give access to additional financial support if there are any particular, um, you know, if the student is the first time uh, at university for a family, parents haven't been to university, then there is normally extra finance available often from the universities. And it, as I say, every little helps in these days. If the students think about doing a deferred entry, in other words, they're not going to go to university in 2023, but want to go in 2024, 
They have two options. They can either do a deferred entry. If that's the case, they have to check with the university that actually the course is going to be running in 2024. Or the other one is that they decide to do a gap year. And if they do that, we'll quite happily support them through their application process. They can either go through the school or come back to us just for a reference. Can I just say student finance? We do do, a, I, do a, I do a whole assembly on student finance. Once we know what that will be, that assembly will probably be in about um, March times 2023. Um, I've more or less got a reasonable head around, my head around student finance. So therefore, um, I can talk to the students about that. And if there are any issues, they can come back to me. Um, the application process, just to say one or two other bits and pieces, obviously, once it's submitted, we've got UCAS track, we've got extra, we've got confirmation, we've got clearing. Um, and adjustment isn't running this summer for 2022. And I don't know whether it'll be running for 2023. You may have heard it, don't worry. Um, if it is running and available to the students, I will explain to them as and when what it is. Um, we give specialist support to our Oxbridge candidates, our medics, our vets are all given specialist support. Um, I don't know who's got a microphone open, but if they can, yeah, but we, we yes, that's, I think I've got that one. Um, for example, I've arranged for the medics to meet a doctor um, on Thursday the 4th of July for about an hour, a uh, very familiar face to me. Um, so uh, actually it's my son and he's hoping to arrange for a friend of his who's a vet to come in as well but we're still working on that one okay one of the things that's worth doing is that we encourage the students to follow UCAS on social media um, I would also encourage you parents to do the same huge amount of information posted there on social media on the if nothing else just follow UCAS on Facebook um, because they post information all the time um, for the students and it's worth looking at. And there are also things like um, discussion groups available once students are a bit more settled as to which course they're going to go on. OK, so having been at, sort of fell out fairly quickly, we're going to um, go for questions in the chat box. Um, can I just say if you've got any particular questions you want to address to me, you can then send them to my email address. So I think um, we will move to any questions. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and, and Miss Cheshire, I believe, has been looking at the chat and is going to pick up and I will also have a look as well. So.